Hello and welcome to Rock Paper Shotgun. This is Matthew, one of RPS's three horsemen of the video apocalypse, which is just as bad as the real apocalypse, except we ask you to like and subscribe at the same time. I saw a chunk of Darksiders 3 at Gamescom this year, but wanted to wait to play more of the game to see the general sales pitch in the flesh. If you're new to the series, then you may be faintly aware that it's based on the tale of the Four Horsemen and their parallel aims to clean up a premature apocalypse. Hey, we've all been there, right guys? <laughs> What's unusual about the series is that each game stars a new horseman. In the past, war was accused of ending the world too early, which is pretty bad as goofs go, and death tried to get him off the hook. Hero number three is Fury, who is asked by the Charred Council to hunt down the seven deadly sins released in all this palaver. That's the Charred Council, by the way, not Charred Council, which is the town council for the small Somerset town of Chard. You can tell them apart because one of them polices hell on earth, and the other one answers fly-tipping questions, and appointed this man as the town crier. For more insightful observations like that, why not subscribe to Rock Paper Shotgun before moving on to the rest of the video? For now, let's see how well this new hero, and her new style of adventure, holds up. After a couple of hours with the game, here's where we're at. If you were expecting to dust off the combat skills a master's war or death, you are in for a rough ride. Fury is a very different character to handle. To steal an idea from Mission Impossible Fallout, if war and death were the hammer, then Fury is the scalpel. She's lethal one-on-one, -on -one, with an evasive dodge that gives her access to all those squidgy bits that enemies hide on their backs. Timing her dodge to the last possible moment gets a burst of slow motion, and the chance for a violent counter-attack, a move that owes more to Bayonetta's acrobatic grace than the pounding forwards charge of death and war. I enjoy the one-on-one -on -one combat, I'm a big fan of whips in action games. One of my favourite weapons of all time is the combat cross in Castlevania Lords of Shadow, and this has very similar heft, whether you're lashing a bug across the face or yanking enemies into the air. It feels vicious and spiky, which is exactly what you want from a whip made of spikes. Give Fury a Crowder control and she's less able. Her strikes don't have the arc to beat back the surrounding forces, and enemies have a habit of rushing you en masse. Maybe this is particular to this demo area, it is a giant hive of bugs after all, and you can't blame insects for swarming. But enemy behaviour aside, it's much harder timing dodges with a sea of snapping jaws and claws, something not helped by the camera struggling to frame fights in tight corridors. Camera tweaks are still being made, but even so, this isn't really a character made for tight enclosures. The designers say it's intentional, that you're meant to watch the landscape, learn enemy patrols, and pick them off where you can. The classic combat rhythm of a Dark Souls game, in other words. It's easy to see how this is done in the wider city streets up above, but down here it's hard to get one monster's attention without alerting the horde. I just hope that the final game eases us into the pace of it a little better. Fury feels more fragile, but it does kind of fit with the larger shape of the game. The first Darksiders was a decent Zelda clone, and Darksiders 2 was a Zelda clone with a heavy dose of Diablo looting. Darksiders 3 takes a step to the side and takes its cues from Metroid. Instead of an overworld peppered with dungeons, you're in one super dungeon, a vastly interconnected world. In this context, Fury is meant to feel like a vulnerable speck, gradually navigating this huge daunting landscape. I'll get to the new map design in a second, but I'm also interested to see how she holds up as a Metroid-style hero. You see, I associate the genre with a drip feed of new weapons and abilities, each letting you drill a little deeper into unexplored territory. Darksiders 3 handles this side of business with hollows, elemental forms that give Fury a new move and a new weapon. In this demo she has two of four hollows unlocked, Flame and Force. Flame gives her the Chains of Scorn, which are pointy and burny, which is always a good combination, and lets her burn through spiderwebs. She can also fire herself upwards with a flaming lunge. This is the game's take on the double jump, but it doesn't get a good workout in this demo beyond banging her head on the low metro system roofs. The Force Hollow gives her the Mallet of Scorn, which lets you mix in giant hammer attacks with your faster whip moves. 
If you played Darksiders 2 and favoured hammer weapons, you'll be familiar with this, it's all wind up and release. Difference is, Fury is so puny, it's risky to pin her down with such a heavy weapon. I found it more of a liability, so stuck with the flames. It also lets you smash purple rocks, not too exciting to be honest, but the trailers show it climbing walls like Metroid Spiderball. Sadly, there was no chance for that in these gunk-filled tunnels. At Gamescom, senior designer Richard Verodi told me that item design is driven more by the relationship between their abilities, and the potential for traversal powers to be strung together to clear a tricky room. My concern is that this demo has little use for them beyond burning webs and knocking down rocks. They are basically keys rather than toys. That said, the nature of the world design is such that the deeper you travel, towards the centre of the earth, the more fantastical the settings and challenges will become. I'm hoping the relatively tame corridors of this demo are just due to it being a boring underground setting. One of the challenges with making a demo for Darksiders 3 is that the world isn't the neatly partitioned realm of dungeons seen in the previous two games. It's quite hard to take a chunk of the game, as it's a huge network of interconnected pieces. Verodi refers to it as honest geometry, which is a fun way of saying that everything has to logically exist to a correct scale. If you travel 500 metres down into a subterranean tomb, then the designers have 500 metres of height to build said tomb. What it really boils down to is that moment of Metroid magic, where you barge through an unfamiliar door, or fall through a strange hole, only to loop back into familiar territory. It was a trick used to brilliant effect in Dark Souls, where linking up a shortcut to an earlier area would come with a huge flood of relief. Which is hard to demonstrate in a demo limited to one area of the game. In truth, I'm not sure the Hive is the best showcase for the philosophy. There's a good bit of foreshadowing, where you can see a boss lurking across a giant canyon in the opening area, but the level is otherwise a knot of messy tunnel design, with no distinguishing features to help you navigate. By the end of the level, I had looped back to the start in some clever ways, but I only really noticed it when I was going back over my footage for this video, which isn't how most people play the game. I got a better feel for it in the hands-off demo, set in the world above, where you can see the tip of a massive tree on the horizon, and gradually fight towards the roots. The team were keen to point out how giant holes in the floor or ceiling let you peer into spaces you'll be visiting later, and I am a big fan of the if you can see it, you could probably get there vibe. One offshoot of the follow the landmark idea is that the game has no map or mini-map, they want you to get lost on your way and discover new adventures. In this demo, it means getting confused in lots of identikit tunnels. It'll take a much larger chunk of the game to see if they've pulled off this idea successfully. At the heart of all this is the hunt for the seven deadly sins for the Chard, not Chard, Council. Interestingly, there's some degree of freedom as to what order you tackle the sins. What with the sprawling map design, the logic goes that if you can find a boss, you can fight that boss. You're introduced to the concept in a slightly more guided way, with a fixed fight against Envy, represented here as a strange bird creature. It's a really old school bit of boss design, with clear stages of escalation as the fight pummels Fury through multiple floors of a tall building. This in turn forces you to mix traversal with attack combos, as you desperately climb the rubble to attack the flying boss. It's here that Darksiders 3 most resembles the earlier games, the idea of the boss as a sort of puzzle to be solved is a very Zelda-like design, and instantly familiar to anyone who's been in War or Death's Boots. Verodi clearly lights up when he talks about the boss fights, getting excited for us to see some of the biggest fights they've ever made, with unexpected multi-stage or multi-room twists to look forward to. What we didn't expect from his descriptions was to be fighting a giant bug carried on a throne by subservient cockroaches. This is Sloth, the laziest of the sins, thus the insect servants. This is the creature I spot from the opening of the underground, and acts as a suitably harsh full stop on the end of our hive adventure. The aim is to take out his loyal slaves to drop him to the ground, and continue the fight on more equal footing. And in a way, it's the perfect encapsulation of Fury's strengths and weaknesses. Taking out an army of cockroaches is surprisingly rough with her poor area of attack, I died many, many times. 
but once you've singled him out, you can have fun unleashing a brutal beatdown. I also like that he sounds a bit like Fagin from Oliver Twist, but your mileage may vary on that point. Darling, you will look like I'll be fighting any fate or any one anytime soon. Again, I'm more intrigued in the freedom to tackle bosses in an order of our choosing. The idea that different people will encounter them with different unlocked powers makes me think of Mega Man and how certain weapons chew through certain robot masters with ease. Will Darksiders 3 have a similar optimal route through? It'll be fun to find out how my journey differs from yours. I'm told the difficulty scales with every sin you capture, but again, we need to see all seven sins out in the wild before we can judge how well the idea works. And if all else fails, they could always make this guy a boss. I'd play that. However the failings and successes balance out in the final game, part of me is just happy to see Darksiders back on the screen. With the collapse of THQ in 2012, it was far from a done deal. To me, the appeal of Darksiders is seeing an old idea done well. It's like a 3D adventure from the late 90s, early noughties, a time when you had simple A to B quests punctuated by fights, puzzles and massive bosses that feel like a mix of a fight and a puzzle. There used to be loads of these games, but now publishers seem almost embarrassed by their simplicity, the kind of thinking that rebooted Tomb Raider into a psychological study of a survivor, or turned God of War's Kratos into a handbook for distant dads. They're still great games, but slightly bogged down with a worthiness, almost ashamed of their broader beginnings and afraid to be openly stupid. Darksiders 3, on the other hand, is willfully daft, I mean, it has a giant bug carried on his throne by tiny bugs, and Fury's hair changes colour based on what weapon she has activated. It's all delightfully silly. The big question is whether it'll all hold together. I'm not sure the underground area we played is the best showcase for the game's big ideas. It's a very combat focused slog through slightly confusing tunnels after all. That doesn't diminish the excitement I have for the bigger picture. I love Metroid games, I love exploration, and I love old fashioned bosses. I really hope Gunslinger games do pull it off, as it sounds like a game I really want to play. And if it doesn't hold together, well, I'll turn off my PC and head to the lovely Somerset village of Chard instead. I hope you found this video useful in some way. If you have any questions, just pop them in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them. Make them about Darksiders 3, ideally. And if you enjoyed this video, please do consider subscribing to Rock Paper Shotgun. We take regular looks at upcoming PC games, so why not check out our recent previews of Call of Cthulhu or Hitman 2 while you're here. And please hit the notification bell, or you won't hear when our videos go live, which is the end of the world as we know it. Thanks for watching, and we'll hopefully see you soon. Bye for now.